Okay, we're back. We're live for the 4 o'clock rock. <clears throat> this is uh, the Hawaii, the state of clean energy, our regular Wednesday show. It's our flagship show. Um, and we love this show, 4 to 5 every Wednesday. That's what it's about. And we're, we're in a sequence now. We did a sequence of, on, of about a month on LNG. And now we're in a sequence on transportation. This is the second show on transportation. Uh, the last show last week, we talked about uh, statutory targets um, in transportation as there are in renewables in general. Um, so we want to talk about that, but I guess the way to talk about that is to say hi to you guys. Dave Ralph, Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association. Thank you, Jay. Gary Slovin, the Alliance of, um, what is it, Auto Manufacturers. Right. Thank you very much for coming down, you guys. Sure, happy to be here. So let's talk about the big news. That's the important thing. You got the, you got the car show coming up on uh, this weekend, this weekend. What's going to happen, Dave? Well, the auto show is wonderful. The first Hawaiian International Auto Show. It's its 38th year. But, you know, people uh, have always said to me, you know, if you want to make a change in America, you have to make a change in terms of a car or a pizza. So we serve pizza down at the auto show. I mean, the Papa John's is wonderful. And you'll see really the future down there because uh, the, uh, this year it has this Stendalismo effect, you know, where, where uh, Stendhal saw Florence and his knees buckled. You walk in that show and your Stendhal? Knees uh, Stendhal. Stendhal, uh -huh. the French author? No. <laughs> He's a French author. Well, Stendhal, yes. Stendhal. Uh, from way back. Yeah, I want to be clear about this. Yeah. This is a I classy this show. show. It's a classy <laughs> show. So, we, so may, <laughs> we may say <laughs> we talk about transportation, but we talk about French authors. Yeah, French authors. The 19th yeah, that's century. Right. That's great. Right. 19th century French authors. Outstanding. Author. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hope you can better that. Well, waiting yeah. for Godot is relevant to the, some of this, these issues, yeah. I think. Okay. Hold that thought. <laughs> okay, back anyway, to the auto show. Auto show is fantastic <laughs> this year. And 350 cars and trucks, a lot of 2016s and 2017 models there, too. We have one, the Bentley Bentayga, that'll just take your breath away. I mean, it's the fastest SUV there is at 187 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, it goes 0 to 60 How and 4.0. A uh, quarter million to 300,000, and it's I got the wonderful, <laughs> you know, wonderful uh, bl unblemished uh, bullhide uh, interior and, and uh, you know, eucalyptus trim. And it's a gorgeous vehicle. It has a big effect on the public. A lot of people come to the auto show, don't they? They do. And they want to they be close to the cars. They want to dream and imagine that they'll have cars like that, or they want to see their next car. Yeah. Living the dream. Despite what some people think, uh, surveys show that people of all ages still desire cars. Yeah, and that's the problem. Can well, we touch on that? You know, this, this country. Depends if you're a car person. <laughs> as I am, person. I don't think it's a problem. This is, you know, this is this this country since the beginning of the car. Well, we invented the car, didn't we? Pretty much. The French did. They, that's, uh, we get yeah. l'automobile. Okay, must have been that guy, uh, Stendhal. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he was French. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, in <clears throat> California, you know, romanticized it. People driving across the country, so much in the media about how, you know, car. I mean, if you sit and watch on Saturday night any anything on a network uh, television, there's another car commercial every 15 minutes, maybe five minutes. Um, and I think what's interesting, too, is that Hawaii is at the far extreme of that. I will never forget the day I arrived here, which was October 1st, 1965, and I got a cab at the airport, and it was a Cadillac. I don't think I'd been in a Cadillac <laughs> up to that point in my life, but a cab, a Cadillac. New York City had checker cabs like Abercrombie mm -hmm. used to drive, right? right. And, and, and now we have a Cadillac cab take me into, into town. I said, you know, people out here must love their cars, and they do. So they come to the car show. Well, you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the uh, cars on television. In fact, we have the bowl cars. They're called at the auto show. Those cars that appeared in the Super Bowl. You remember the Christopher Walken commercial <laughs> with the sock, and you remember, uh, you know, we have a, 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 all those different cars that appeared in the Super Bowl. They're all kind of be there at the auto show. So, but we're in a transitional time now. Because we're at some kind of combination of tipping points. And one of them, you know, which, which we've seen before at the car show, because we've covered it the last couple of years anyway, uh, is that high tech. It's all yes. about high tech. And uh, maybe because the federal government, you know, regulates the car business into high tech, or maybe it's because the market regulates it into yeah, high tech. I think it's, it's as much, the, uh, probably more the market. And as far as the fuel standards are concerned and the higher miles per gallon, that's been mandated by the government. But the technology is a result of the miniaturization. Um, the car today is really a computer on wheels. 
and the miniaturization has provided that, and that's been spurred by competition within the, within the industry. Yeah, and it's all over the world. European cars have the same kind of uh, Yes, yeah, in our technology. organization, it's the Alliance of Auto Manufacturers. We have 12 of the manufacturers in the world, and um, so it's, it's worldwide. And you the, represent 12? Well, I represent the Alliance, and the Alliance is a combination of the 12 different it. manufacturers. You must feel right. good walking down the street. Well, I love cars, so okay. that, that, that's part of it. <laughs> I also support public transportation, okay. but the car is uh, obviously, and it's not just an American phenomenon, it, it is all over the world. But the car of today, and you'll see this at the auto show, does things that would, we've talked about a little bit uh, before the show. There are cars now that will avoid a collision. There are cars that will avoid your car changing a lane if you fall asleep. Uh, we have the rear view. Right now. Right now. On the market. I can on the go market. See them at, at the auto show. At the show. Self parking. Um, it's not everywhere, but what is happening is that these technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper. You're seeing, for example, the rear view uh, camera, which is so valuable. A friend of mine bought a cheap uh, Honda recently. It, it's in that car. So these technologies are becoming a widespread and they're increasing safety and they're decreasing accidents. Are they, are they really working? You know, new technology, like if I go buy a new software, a new computer, you know, I'm, I'm about 75% sure that it'll work c because it's new and maybe the bugs haven't been worked out. If I buy a new car with all this technology, am I sure it's going to work? The reliability is very high, and the statistics are showing that these technologies are avoiding accidents. And you know, there's an, another benefit from avoiding accidents, which is interesting. Every time there's an accident, people hear about what happens on the highway and the congestion you get, the rubbernecking, police closing the road. So reducing accidents reduces congestion. It also increases, uh, decreases the use of fossil fuel because people aren't just sitting watching an accident <laughs> anymore. So the, interestingly, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is very supportive of the autonomous car because the fact of the matter is that 90% of accidents are driver error. Yeah. And many times you hear that it was a technical problem, like somebody um, uh, hit, the, hit the brake and the, and the brake didn't work, and so you, or you had sudden acceleration. What's happened is that the person's put on the accelerator and they thought they were hitting the brake. So these technologies are changing these things and avoiding that and avoiding accidents. Yeah, and, and now autonomous cars. You say there's uh, at least a partly autonomous car at the auto show that I can look at. You bet. In fact, yeah. the autonomous car comes in like four tiers. Well, the tier one is those that will park themselves and that uh, actually will stay in the lane on the highway and will have anti-collision devices in them. In fact, I was going to add that there's so many cars at the show that are so loaded with everything. In terms of a pizza, you'd say they have the works. I mean, you would go backup cameras and the. Oh, and in fact, there's a website uh, that goes mycardoeswhat.org, and you, when you get to go down the show, it's a manufacturer's show represented by Gary's uh, folks here. All the manufacturers are there with product experts uh, like the hydrogen fuel cell electric car. We'll have Maggie Clark there, that was a very famous spokesperson for them. Uh, at uh, Toyota and explaining everything about that hydrogen car. Uh, and so you get to ask all those experts, how does this work? And it does this, and oh my goodness, I had no idea. Look, that comes down. And it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, uh, but I have a question I want to ask you. Putting aside renewables, we will talk about renewables here in the show, but mm -hmm. we have to. <laughs> it's, right. you know, the Hawaii the Energy, energy Policy Forum. No, so, <clears throat> but uh, putting aside renewables for a minute, if I, if I, if I gave you a hypothetical uh, that uh, these cars would have cars, American cars, cars would have all this technology. In fact, not only the technology that you're talking about today, but more and more and more technology, smartest in the world, you know, autonomous and um, s self self controlling and uh, gee, uh, efficient, you know, and probably we would reduce traffic if we had more efficient cars that mm -hmm. okay. manage themselves on the highway. Yes. Um, and without renewables now, just ordinary fossil fuel cars, would that solve the problem that we're talking about? We've done that calculation. Really? Uh, yeah, the um, automobile dealers said that at some point the manufacturers will make 100 mile per gallon cars and that will actually address the whole fuel issue. We noted that under the CAFE standards, those corporate average fuel economy standards that Gary said are increasing so dramatically up to 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025, we well, as a requirement. As a requirement. For a we passenger help, car. 
for passenger right. cars. That's pretty and yeah. We helped Senator Inouye set those standards, and we yeah. asked that he divide cars and trucks for an additional five years to get Ford Motor Company and others the opportunity to develop their electric cars. But uh, yeah, what's going to happen when when cars get that much in the way of miles per gallon because of turbocharging and all those wonderful other additional things, and going up to six gears, seven gears, eight mm -hmm. gears, right. you know, and uh, shutting down some cylinders, and start stop sort of technology right. is Super just absolutely efficient. phenomenal yes. stuff yeah. about. You know that Bentley that I talked about that goes zero to sixty in, in uh, four seconds. It's twenty nine miles per gallon uh, on the highway. It's just astounding. How can a big SUV like that get get that kind of mileage? Yeah. Well. Uh, we consume about 500 million gallons a year right now in Hawaii. And just uh, with the CAFE standards alone, we're going to reduce that amount of 500 million gallons down by 185 million gallons just with the standards, since you talked about standards and goals. Yes. So think about how much we've dropped, 185 million gallons a year, just by setting some goals and having the manufacturers say, all right, fine mm -hmm. with us, we'll do that. Now, it's going to bring the cost of the car up about $3,000 per, per vehicle. The cost of the car would come up with renewables anyway, wouldn't it? I mean, maybe maybe the fuel would be a, God, different, a whole different price. Well, point, really, no. Uh, the, you, the electric car is going The Miura down. is a hydrogen car. The last time I looked, it was $57,000. If you look before that, it was $100,000. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, <laughs> so the, it has the reverse Moore's Law. You know, uh, the Moore's Law, where they talked about the computer chip, uh, every two years it doubles in its cap capability. Uh, well, and, and halves in price. Well, my concept of reverse Moore's law is that the hydrogen car every five years halves in price. So it started in 2010. I drove that one, by the way, uh, and, and it was $100,000. Now it's in the $50,000 range in 2015, and by 2020 it may be down in that twenty dollars to $30,000 range. So, you know, they'll just keep getting it uh, lower priced and lower priced as that hydrogen fuel cell and batteries become, um, you know, more ubiquitous and, and more highly produced. But, there, but there's still our limits. And, for example, I think the California Air Resources Board, which has set a lot of these standards, says that today, if you're talking about a gasoline car, standard car you're talking about, $25,000, the electric version is going to be 17000 more. Now, a lot of that is being made up today by various kinds of subsidies. And for a lot of the manufacturers, a lot of the electric cars being sold today are being sold at losses because they, they have to sell them. You know, it's not a requirement that they make them. It's a requirement they sell them. And so that's an issue for the manufacturers. Why is that, that, for is dealers. that, is that a legal requirement? That's the way the law In works. California. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other ZIP states, too. So as these standards come into play, people are going to buy them. And that well, is an issue. Well, it's not people got to buy them. It's dealers have to buy them. That's what's so yeah. bizarre. <laughs> it's not <laughs> that the people point. have to buy them. Because the, uh, Gary's customers are the dealers, not the people. Yeah, so that's in other words, the people are the customers yeah, as a dealer. Yeah, so so they, what it, happens, they sit in the so back we've tried to change the price that law. goes down, well, We've down, tried down. to change that law to say that well. uh, it, it would, it, it, when you have public uptake of the vehicle, that would provide the credits for it instead of the dealer's uptake for it. Yeah. You know, one, one approach to this, I know we're changing the subject a little bit here, Jay. We, we don't mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that, uh, interestingly, while the governments are all in favor of this and the manufacturers have invested billions, and the dealers have as well. The dealers invest mm -hmm. a lot of money in making this work mm -hmm. because they've got to change the, the, the way they service Training, cars and tax, so on. Tools. A lot, yeah. a lot of, and they have to buy the cars. It's incumbent on them to spend the money for the new infrastructure. It, mm -hmm. it is. But there's one entity that isn't spending money to support this right now, it's government. Government, mm -hmm. even in California, in California, 97.5% of the vehicles bought are standard gasoline vehicles. The rest of the uh, 10 states that have these, what's called zero emission vehicle standards, 99 plus percent of the vehicles they're buying are fueled by gasoline. Mm. It would help a lot mm -hmm. if the governments would establish policies to buy these cars. Yes. And they, so far, they're not doing it. Interesting. Well, but we're getting there. And, and one, the, other, the other place we're getting is we're getting to a break. <laughs> uh, I, I have it on good uh, uh, information that we're going to have a break right now. Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? 
So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Watch this. You're going to get some numbers now that will show you that these guys aren't kidding around. We're talking about incentives. And we're talking about trying to change you know, public opinion and bring them to renewable cars. And that's what the show is ultimately about. We're trying to change you know, dealers, uh, maybe not by force so much as that has been the case, but in other ways to incentivize them to like. We're, uh, and and, we're, and we're, um, ultimately, we have to also talk about charging stations. Uh, to incentivize everybody around charging stations. Got to be able to charge the car if you're going to right. drive it. And, and if you build a, if you incentivize a charging station, you have secondary incentive, incentives going out to the public, which is cool. Anyway, you had some numbers, Gary, during the break. You know, it's too bad you guys, you know, can't stay around with us during the breaks because you would hear some amazing stuff. <laughs> That's the Gary. best stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're talking about incentives. The manufacturers and the dealers both want to be able to sell these cars because the federal government is requiring it. They can't meet the standards coming in the future unless these electric vehicles, and there are different kinds of electric vehicles, but unless they're sold. So far, there's some resistance to it. So here, here's some numbers that may reveal um, how, how you can get these to be sold. So this, these are numbers from the southeast. Alabama last year, 905 electric vehicles. South Carolina, 245. Mississippi, 220. Tennessee, 3,038. But here's the interesting one. Georgia, 23,080. The most happen? in the country because Georgia has rich incentives. They also have rich incentives for the um, TV and, and film industry, by the way. They're big believers in it. So what this demonstrates, and, and by the way... take a page out of their book. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in 2015, however, and I don't have the, the, the most recent numbers, the 2016, that incentive, uh, I believe, has gone away, gone away. and it's dropped, nine, the sales dropped 90%. 90%. So, that's so how much the incentive? We like need incentives to sell these cars. People are resisting buying them, and I think the manufacturers, I'm sure the dealers too, are trying to figure out how you do get people to buy them, but incentives is one. Now, the incentive is in Georgia primarily money, but there's other incentives like driving in the HOV lane, free parking and the public well, meters. Let's talk about this. I mean, you know, we are deeply ingrained in cars. We, we have an American car culture. And um, part of that is, uh, you know, the... Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> and the four on the floor and all that stuff. The electric it's, car is quiet, you know. You don't get the, uh, with no, the electric yeah, car, right, yeah, Dave? Well, maybe you can get like a kitten. <laughs> it's, like, it's like we used to put like uh, playing cards in the spokes of our bicycle wheels, so it would make a racket. Right, I remember that. And you feel like you had a motorcycle with a playing card and a clothespin. You know, he's old enough. <laughs> a lot of people watching the show are going to think no, they're no, already, no. you know. <laughs> Electric cars like piloting the cloud, it's really quiet. Yeah, it's really quiet. But, but you know, I suppose you could make an electric car that makes a racket. Maybe that would be popular. But yeah. l let's talk about the, all the kinds of things we could do to change the way the public feels about this. Because it really has to, you, you have to really change public opinion at a fundamental level. I mean, cars are so important to our lives and to our history and to our families. I mean, everything, they are central. They are more important than, than our computers <laughs> and our televisions. <laughs> mm, right. Oh, you're right. So, so the question is, how do we, you know, hypothetically, how do we make this shift? How do we make it sh the shift so it works for the, the manufacturers? I mean, they got to have incentives to somehow. Uh, the dealers, you know, because they got to build infrastructure, and it seems unfair to tell them, you know, you go build it. Uh, on the other, on the other hand, you know, it seems to me, and you can comment, is that maybe the whole model about dealerships will change, is changing right now. You know, I go on the web, I, I know the price, I push the button, it's delivered uh, by some young fellow the following morning. That's the end of that. Um, you know, like, like buying a computer, it comes with a UPS. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, of course, there's tax incentives, there's incentives for charging stations, developers and all that, uh, landowners, who knows what. Um, there's incentives 
negative incentives, incentives that, you know, if you thought the barrel tax was high, how about making it 20 times higher? That would have an effect on fossil fuel. So what do you think, guys? If, if, we, if we made ourselves a committee of three um, to decide how this is going to happen and uh, reach, reach renewables earlier. We know exactly how to do that. Okay, okay, how do we do it? Well, first of all, talk to your neighbor who, who has an electric car, and then that uh, happens pretty Im Im immediately. You get to understand all the things because your neighbor will tell you everything about it. They're, they're the most joyous people in explaining their cars of anyone you run into. In fact, they have the highest re-up rate for any type of vehicle. If you have an electric car, 85% you'll, you'll re-up in, in a lease. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you reach that critical number of 4,000, then there's a million cars on the road then if you have 4,000 of them are electric cars, then one out of every 250 cars is electric. And I maintain that's the Joe Girard rule of 250, which says that, you know, when you had a, a wedding, you, you got 250 cards to send it out, and there was a funeral, you sent 250 cards out. Well, everybody has 250 friends. So if that's the, the case... world according to Dave. I know, it's got it, but anyway, <laughs> that's how it works. And so, first of all, the word of mouth is the most powerful thing uh, in, in coming to understand how the electric car works, because people can tell you how their range works and, and how much they enjoy be, it being quiet. So public and education. Right. And then what happened uh, years ago when they had that CFL bulb and they wanted to have that, uh, the, they put up $3 million, they hired Jade Moon, she came on the uh, uh, air and, and squig ran, put the squiggle bulb in, and uh, they, they didn't pay Jade Moon $3 million, but they did a $3 million ad campaign, including her as a spokesperson, and we had a dramatic change to the CFL bulb. If you had that similar type campaign, if you had the availability of the vehicles, there were four of them just a few years ago, now there are 22 of them. You know, and we have eight at the auto show right now, so they're, they're out there. Uh, and um, so you put that big education campaign, um, you put the, all these neighbors that have them, and uh, you just get the buzz going, and uh, you keep the credits at $7,500, and the HOV lane is worth, according to this big study that came out December 15th from the University of Hawaii, and that's worth $1,000 to each buyer, and the, and the uh, free parking is worth 1200 So that's another 2200 on the top of the car, besides the $7,500. So let them use the, the electrics can use, or renewables can use the HOV. With, one, with right. one occupant. One. Uh -huh. Okay. So yeah, that's why it's exactly. the value of that. And yeah. parking, uh, free parking. Parking, parking, parking is parking. really important. At city, at city and uh, state lots. Yeah, that would incentivize and people a lot, but wouldn't it? 2200 bucks worth. Yeah, I think uh, Dave, yeah. Dave's right that there's, there's got to be more public education, but there are factors um, in many places, range anxiety, for example, um, and even the charging times. Uh, I know the other, you were talking about the superchargers last week's show. It's still a half hour, and the superchargers are very expensive. Now, these things will change over time, but right now, it's still, over the next few years, those are obstacles to people getting into these cars. The government's got to play a role. Uh, there was a company, for example, here a few years ago that was going to build charging stations all over the island. I remember talking to them about their business model seeming to be challenged. Well, guess what? They're not in business anymore. Yeah. So if you're going to have, and this is one of the advantages of the hydrogen car, because it behaves more like the standard car today. You can fuel it in, what, two minutes or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same yeah. as a, well, not two minutes, but about, about the same as you do a gasoline yeah. car. Well, let me, so, I mean, I'm, I'm all confused about this. I like hydrogen. I like Stan Osterman, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen yeah. Man. He's trying. The, the He's general. a great guy. He's yeah. Are we supporting uh, him? I wish, wish him well in every particular, yeah. but are we going to have hydrogen and electrics on the road at the same time? Yeah. Is there room for both of them? How do they... How do they coordinate all the that? The manufacturers feel that you're going to have a, you're going to have a ver variety. It may not all be at the same fueling station, but maybe it will. Right now, we have actually 27 models of what we call zero emission vehicles. So there's the the battery kind, the the plug-in, and the the hydrogen. Only two of those models presently available. But you will have a range of them, and you're still going to have. The gasoline-fueled cars with very high mileage, perhaps, mm -hmm. we're going to have them for a very long time as well. So you're going to have a range of these. And the advantages are that gradually you'll get the zero-emission vehicles on the road. But in the meantime, uh, in terms of emissions, you know, the, in a few years, the car, if you buy a new car that's powered by gasoline, there'd be virtually no emissions coming out of that car. Because of the efficiency. <clears throat> this, is, this changes, this has to change, for example, the nature of a gas station. I mean, I can see if all three kinds exist, the smart station guy is going to have fossil fuel because a lot of people will continue to use that for a while. 
um, it's going to have uh, electric charges, fast charges, and we have to find a way to mm -hmm. stimulate the development of fast charges. Mm -hmm. Maybe the technology will come along too. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then we have to have hydrogen if we, if we ha have half an expectation that hydrogen is in there too. Did I miss something? We have all three yeah. anyway. That Why not have all be three natural gas station? at some point, possibly? Yeah, yeah, natural no, gas. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're going to have a, you're going to have a variety. How do you do that? And my vision would be to have this charging charging gas station, you know, fully equipped gas station <clears throat> as a standard element around our city, our state. You go to a gas station, it's got all three. Jay, and if we can do that now, how do we do that? Well, I think th that you'll see those fast charging stations, those level threes, probably more in front of a Starbucks than you will at a uh, gas station because mm -hmm. it's going to take about 30 minutes and it'll probably be near shopping malls where you'll you'll be doing something and then right. come back to your vehicle and they're mainly used to top off the batteries instead of people just don't go in there you know with zero practically they'll go in and say gosh I'd like to fill up a, you know I say fill up the top off about <laughs> uh, five minutes worth uh, maybe ten minutes worth so not much longer than other places but I, I don't know that you'll necessarily see that at uh, filling stations but could I want to predict something else too we have condominiums we have 18,000 condominium projects in this state that's a lot yeah. okay if you live in a condominium you have an electric car and you want to charge it you have a problem because yeah. it costs a fortune to run the line and the uh, the higher capacity you know the charger the more expensive the line so why do we do that let's have it in front of Starbucks Let's have it on the corner of grocer. Let's have it at the supermarket. Let's let's have it everywhere. Well, that's where the hydrogen car is more attractive because then you can just go and fuel up quickly. I think the condominium situation is a problem because we not only are there a lot of them, as you point out, a lot of them are older, and a lot of them they couldn't even support having a significant number of charges. You know, maybe they can do a couple. They can't yeah, do enough yeah. to support everybody in the country. It's just going to be very expensive, very inefficient, and uh, right. it's not going to be incentive. It's a de-incentive right now, I think. Yeah. I mean, we think, manufacturers do th think that the governments that want this are going to have to invest, be willing to in be investment partners. In California, the California government is putting big money into developing hydrogen stations. They're working in conjunction with the manufacturers and um, fueling companies, but the government has got a stake in it and they're investing big money in it. Is it happening? It is, it is happening. Built? It's happening more slowly than they hoped because, you know, they weren't into problems, but th yes, they are. And they hope to have basically a hydrogen highway that runs from Sacramento to San Diego so that you can fuel your car all the way. And one of the advantages of the hydrogen car is that, you know, they'll have range 250 to 350 miles. The electric cars are coming. The Tesla has that long range, but I mean, a lot of them um, are relatively uh, short. I mean, even the Nissan, which is the most popular one, I guess, that's 107 90 now. Or 107 so. now, the new model. Yeah, right. you, you guys agree with me, though. I think we all agree that um, that the future of renewable cars is really a function of these of the uh, ubiquity of these stations. If we can build a lot of stations, then people are going to go buy the cars. It's that simple. Until we do that, everybody, including my wife, is not going to buy a car where she has any range anxiety at all. Right. You know? I think the number we thought would be a, a huge goal to hit would be 40,000 by 2030. Stations. Uh, no, electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles. <laughs> okay. yeah, 40,000 is a big amount of vehicles uh, out of the million. That would be 4% of all the cars would be. Uh, so if you, so 40,000 vehicles, how many stations do you need to support 40,000 vehicles? You know, I don't know if you charge your... We're going to uh, take, them, uh, we're gonna take yeah. one minute, okay, so Dave can, can carefully consider his answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, you can try to help him out. We'll be right He's back. He's not his own. <laughs> I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye bye. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host a show, Climate Change Beyond Outrage. 
in it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. See you then. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. <music>
and that was for what's called uh, uh, megawatts. In other words, they wanted you to save electricity use uh, with that $3 million campaign. When you put it in an electric vehicle, that is megawatts, and you're adding electric, electricity use, but you're reducing fossil fuel use. So. Uh, they've got to make some kind of public policy changes to figure all that out. What about increasing the, uh, the cost of the tax on a gallon of gas or a barrel of gas? That's coming. You know, and it's, and it's taking a, the money, sort of a barrel tax, taking the money and putting it into charging stations or something to incentivize electric cars. They increased the tax on a barrel of oil from a nickel up to a dollar five, but 60% of it went in the general fund. Yeah. It really needed to have gone toward charging stations, hydrogen fuel stations. Yeah. Is this a great country or what? It's one of the challenges. Well, that, uh, you know, when you have a tax for a specific purpose, it should be used for that purpose, and we've yeah. testified to that time and time yeah, and time again. Yeah. Mm. But that so, money often gets for you. Yeah, that's the way it happens. And, you know, the, uh, the, the challenge that I think has to be seen, it's easy to forget, is particularly when people who are supposed visionaries have these wonderful visions about what everybody else is going to do, especially when they're billionaires. Um, the people who live out in the poorer communities, um, any of these additional charges have a very mm -hmm. big impact on them. Yeah. And that's something that needs to be thought about. They can't go out and buy a new car that often. Right. And that's one of the things that troubles me about having sort of a mandate or a policy that says we're going to get rid of gasoline by a certain date. Because what are those people going to do who can't afford to go out and buy an so a new electric car? You have to give them plenty car. of time to adapt their conduct. So uh, I, I, this came up in the break, and I wanted to pursue it with you now. Is um, What do you guys feel about having a target for transportation renewable cars? You know, I think the problem is uh, if Somebody, uh, Neil Milner, on a program this morning made a comment about um, wishful economics, not based at all on reality of fact. So it's okay to be aspirational, and you want to be to some extent, but if it gets to a point where it's totally unrealistic and has a very negative impact on significant part of your population, then I, I, don't, I don't support that. That's my opinion. The Alliance hasn't discussed it Which that much. Which is part any target at all. I mean, even a target, say, 2045 or even later. Well, I'm okay with some kind of a target, as long as the target has some basis in reality, but it has to be matched with how you help people to get there. If I'm gonna tell somebody who doesn't have much income, you're gonna buy an electric car, your child's gonna buy an electric car in 2045. Okay, I buy an electric car or I send my kid to college. That's gonna be my choice, because a lot of people in 2045 aren't gonna have a whole lot more money than they have today in, in our economy. That's what troubles me with it. If you combine it with the government saying, you know what, I'm going to help you buy that car if you can't afford it. Then so there has to be a plan. Okay. I think there has can't to be, just be both a target sides without a plan. Equation. Right. And I think too many of these targets are just, I'm going to throw a target out there. It's not going to affect me because I'm wealthy, <laughs> so I may, I'll build my own hydrogen plant, so that's fine. Let those people in the other communities, you know, get by the best they can. I think you've got to match the target with a plan that's realistic to get people, help people get to the target. Yeah, so I, California I has agree. had a target for zero, elect, uh, zero yeah. emission vehicles, yeah. and they had another target, and another target, and they, another they target. They made the target. Nine times they've yeah. had to change the target. The target. And their, their targets are called laudable but unattainable. <laughs> L.A., like la, 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 la. And so they, the la, 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 all the time with their targets. The target they had for 400,000 electric vehicles by, by 2030 is like a target of building a, a, a Golden Gate Bridge from here to San Francisco, from Honolulu to San Francisco. It, it's an impossible target uh, unless you just changed everything. In other words, unless you said, all right, we're going to have this massive campaign and we're going to have massive mandates and we're going to raise the, the tax on a barrel of oil. Yeah, I, I don't think people would want to pay that, as Gary said, they would choose between a college education and having uh, you know, that many electric cars. Probably 4%, uh, 40,000 would be a very laudable target if it could be hit. We have 4,000 now, just about 3,200 actually. So it's a, it's a ways to yeah, go. Okay, got it. I think it's Did 800 this last year. Well, one example of this, that, uh, several years ago, there was a government agency that proposed that the dealers be required to buy a certain number of uh, these el electric vehicles. And I made the comment that, okay, what happens if they can't buy them? How about if we add a provision in this bill that says that if they can't sell in 90 days, the government will buy it? And the person who proposed it said, oh, my God, we can't do that. Well, I said, then if you can't do that, you're not willing to be a partner. Mm -hmm. You can't just say to a dealer, 
I'm going to buy this car even though there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to sell it. That's not a plan. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> no, and you have to be reasonable with all the players on the field. No, nobody should, you know, take a bath on this. <laughs> but let me, let me go to one other point. We have a few minutes left here, and that is we talked earlier about autonomous cars. <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, you could salivate about autonomous cars. <laughs> My goodness gracious. That would change our society. You're talking about uh, the elderly wouldn't have to drive. Um, people who are blind uh, or otherwise in incapacitated wouldn't have to drive. Mm -hmm. You could sleep while the car took you there. It would be a magic carpet is what it would be. Mm -hmm. Even better than Uber. <laughs> yes, w yes, definitely. <laughs> Magic carpet. Now that's a wouldn't have a Kalamazoo situation. Yeah, right? You ought to copyright that. I, I like that. You know that Google is working hard on this, and yes, there are a yeah. lot of regulators who would like to see it happen. Although sometimes uh, some of them are following what I call the precautionary principle mm -hmm. and being very tough and stiff about it. Yeah. But but ultimately the, the public wants this. I mean, I think a lot of people want this as much as fossil fuel cars or more. The wire, uh, well, the wires came out today and said that if we had 50 state standards for this, it won't work. So they're asking for national standards on, on the autonomous car. And so yeah. that just came out today. A senator is proposing yeah, that. Would, that'd be pretty good. National standards yeah. for the autonomous yeah. car. I mean, it, it seems a little raucous to have every state with different standards on a car that yeah. yeah. won't cross state lines all the time. I know, right. it makes no sense. Yeah. yeah, that won't work. And that's one thing uh, that's our industry now. really is concerned about, having a national standard and how these things are yeah. done. But the autonomous car, as they pointed out earlier, is going to happen at some point. There are portions of it that are in play right today. It's going to cut way down in accidents. You know, what, it's not just auto collision. The car of the future will be able to tell if there's been an accident three miles down the road so that it will take another route. Yeah. Um, all kinds of things that will help to manage traffic and make life easier. And they fly in formation close to each other. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what's sort of fascinating. Like, that's uh, true. Uh, traffic I, I moves. No well, lollygagging. <laughs> no <laughs> lollygagging. <laughs> I used to fly in a jet, and we would fly in a, in a tight formation, you know, uh, and cars can do that uh, when they're autonomous. So assume with me that the demand of the public and the uh, leverage of the technology will create this, okay? It's that's, inevitable. That's, it's going to, right, yes, inevitable. Oh, uh, everybody, oh God, they could salivate over this. I can feel it now. They spend anything, really, a lot more than you know they would otherwise spend. Uh, and all the technology things that you've been talking about that are going to be at the car show this weekend. Yes. Okay. Those things will be built into these autonomous cars. I mean, it'll have. So they're already be, in. A yeah, lot of them. bristling with every kind of technology you mm -hmm. can imagine, and some you can't. The tier okay. one stuff is already there. How is that going to change the recipe here? Uh, will will the autonomous cars necessarily be electric or hydrogen? Pretty much uh, all. Will the electric. dealers have to change the way they model how they do business? What will how will the manufacturers deal with this? Because it'll be by definition it'll be sweeping change. Well, the the manufacturers are built are building them and researching them now. That's what they're they're aiming toward. They're they're in support, and they're developing all of these features. So I mean they're evolving in this direction right now. So that's, I mean, that's already a given, and dealers are beginning to adapt to it as well. So when we talk about targets, and we talk about incentives this way and that way, it, it all may be overtaken by events, by it's the event OBE, of the autonomous huh? car. OBE. OBE. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what exactly. About the that's exactly right. What mm -hmm. about the dealer state? I mean, the dealers are a strong resource in the state, an important constituency. 15% of the sales. In many ways, they've sales. built the state. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to them? Well, first of all, it's 2025 before you actually have them on the roadways. So that's, what, nine years from now, they think. Uh, and then they become ubiquitous in 2045. So we're looking 30 years down the way. So that's a generation away. That's how long it took to adopt, you know, the, the good old uh, cell phone. But it was faster than you thought. It, you know, it's coming at light speed. Nobody thought that the autonomous car would be this fast. And, and it's Google that's driving the whole thing so hard. Um, and uh, to some degree, Apple. And the, you see the major manufacturers kind of partnering up with those oh, folks. Yes. It's uh, way faster than anyone thought. Bloomberg came out with, uh, you know, I think, a deer in the headlights with, with the eyes this big going, the autonomous car is coming at us faster than we thought. You know, we all are a little deer in the headlights. Okay, so there's a, there's a picture of a bunch of kids, uh, millennials there. You see it? Mm -hmm. It's under a camera, too. 
And uh, they're they're actually uh, they're in a bar drinking. They probably don't have jobs, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're trying to pay off their student loans. <laughs> pay the pay off their student loans. But you mean so they could go home? Guys take could go home in a autonomous car after after drinking. I mean, you maybe so. Well, that's autonomous. true. Thank you for that point. But could you please address them and give them some closing thoughts about what's going to happen here and how should they adapt their own conduct to comport with what you see as the future? You first, Dave. Well, I'd say come to the auto show because it's a great place to meet everybody. In fact, it's a wonderful place for a date. And you will be astounded at the new technology. Your generation loves technology. Come down and just ask yourself, this car does what? Okay. <laughs> Carrie, what do you say? Yeah. Well, I think that for the millennials, actually, it turns out they like cars a lot more than people think. Uh, and this car of the future is going to fit in very well with their expectations. It's going to be very highly technological. It's going to be a lot of fun. Gary Slovin, <laughs> uh, uh, Dave Ralph, um, Gary of the Automobile Manufacturer, the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers, and Dave of the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association. Thank you so much for coming on to our Hawaii Renewable Energy Program. Well, thanks Thank for you, having Dave. us. Yeah, oh, we enjoyed it. It was fun. <laughs>
most important show. <laughs> so come around and listen to us four to five on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. 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 Thank you.